Thank you very much, Sylvia and George, for having me today. Um, I um, am Annabelle Gaberti, the founding partner of the law firm Cressidy, which specializes in providing legal advice to the creative industries. I'm going to make a 40-minute um, presentation today on fashion business partnership and investment, IP as a business asset. If you have some questions, please don't hesitate to send them through the, uh, the, the, the system, through the uh, messaging system of the virtual classroom, or if you prefer, you can also live tweet me on uh, at Cressovy, and I will uh, look at your um, messages and um, tweet at the end of my presentation, which should be around 40 minutes. Sylvia, if we would please kindly move on to the next slide. When you start a business, one of your first major um, points. Annabelle? Can you um, move your headphones? I can't hear you very well. So just ensure that you are speaking into your microphone. Okay, no problem. Um, right. Can you hear me now? No, it's very, very mute. Uh, okay, <laughs> well... Um, it's fine now. Okay, yeah, well, great. Okay, so when you start a business, one of your first major requirements will be to find some funding for your new venture. It's especially true in the fashion world, where you do need a fair amount of raw materials, such as fabric, spools of thread, tools and machinery, to make your products. Fashion is a resource-intensive business. It's also a labor-intensive business because you do need a lot of, you know, tiny, experienced hands to actually uh, fashion your, I mean, make your products, your fashion products. If you, even if you do not make the fashion products yourself, you will have to use the services of manufacturers and suppliers, and that will cost money. We can go to the next slide, Sylvia. So what funding sources are available to fashion entrepreneurs? Well, the easiest and nearest route, I would think, is love money. That means money coming from friends, from family members, or even inheritance money. It, it can take the form of a donation or a gift or an equity investment into your fashion company, or it could be a loan. When you are starting your fashion business, and even after, it's very important that you check what this sum of money, love money, is going to be equivalent to. Is it going to be a donation, as I just mentioned, or an equity investment or loan? If it's a donation or a gift, you have to make sure that it is done in a way that is tax efficient. If it is an equity investment into your fashion company, you ha it's best to do it in a proper way and make sure to have your personal investors sign a share purchase agreement. I'll come back on this point later about share purchase agreements. If it is a loan which is granted to you by a friend or a family member, well, my advice is to actually go to the Consumer Credit Counseling Service or Citizens Advice Bureau or to your lawyer if you can afford it and get guidance on how to draft a written loan agreement to, in order to avoid misunderstanding of family or friends risk. There are also some tax implications if a loan has an interest. So it's best to actually really look into those legal issues um, in relation to the law of money. The second avenue is to obtain a loan. Well, from your bank, of course. A loan can actually be either secured or insecured. 
By this, I mean that your banker could ask you to put some assets as collateral against the loan that he will grant you. It could be a, some collateral, some security interest over your house or over some um, assets of your business, such as intellectual property, your inventory or stock. A loan could actually either be personal or a business loan, depending on your circumstances and the duration of existence of your fashion business. Annabelle, you need to speak into the microphone. Uh, it's very, uh, if you move, then we can't hear you anymore. I'm sorry about that, Sylvia, but the microphone I'm handling, I'm, I'm handling with my right hand, so I'm, I'm, I'm really doing my best here. Is that better? Yes, yeah, better. Third type of funding that source that you can actually um, that is available to a fashion entrepreneur are grants and government schemes. In France, for example, the fashion bank La Banque de la Mode allows young design companies to be granted access to credit more easily in order to finance their collections. A young designer needs to apply to the uh, Fédération Française du prêt à porter féminin, so the French Federation of Women's uh, w Women's Wear, uh, ready, sorry, Women Ready to Wear, and um, can obtain either a guarantee to obtain a loan from a bank, or even obtain some direct funding from from this fashion bank. In the UK, the government has set up a 112 million pounds startup loan scheme, which offers 18 to 30-year-old entrepreneurs loans of about £2,500. For fashion startups, the new gen, for new generation, talent identification scheme of the British Fashion Council is key. New gen offers catwalk designers financial support towards their show cost and the opportunity to use the British Fashion Council catwalk show space. Marie Catron Zoo, Christopher Kane, and her dem have benefited from New Gem. Another avenue that fashion entrepreneurs can explore in terms of finding some funding is to approach business angels and venture capitalists. A business angel is an angel investor which is, who is an affluent individual who provides capital for a business startup, usually in exchange for convertible debt or ownership equity. A small but increasing number of angel investors organize themselves into angel groups and networks. For example, in December 2012, there was the launch of the Fashion Business Angels Network in Paris, organized by the Fédération Française du prêt à porter féminin, uh, which I mentioned before, and the International Chamber of Commerce of Paris. This Fashion Business Angel Network is now looking for fashion startups who um, are interested in collaborating with us by business angels. So why don't you contact them? Venture capital is financial capital provided to early stage, high potential, high risk growth startup companies. Usually venture capital is provided through funds. A VC fund or venture capital fund makes money by owning equity in the companies it invests in. Usually, the ticket to obtain some VC money is when you need an investment of around £1 million. On the other uh, hand, a business angel investment is usually of around one to several thousand pounds or euros. So, I think that for a fashion startup, the first route would be to actually speak to the business angels and then in the second round of financing, if needed, speak to the VCs. 
Crowdfunding is also now an important avenue for fashion startups to obtain some financing. It's, crowdfunding is a collective effort of individuals who network and pull their money, usually via the internet, to support efforts initiated by other people or organizations. Examples of crowdfunding sites are Kickstarter, Indiegogo. I looked on these sites uh, the other day, and I could see that quite a few fashion startups are uh, advertising their projects there. Usually what they present is for a particular sum of money, in exchange you will get, say for example, um, some bow ties and two ties, because we are this um, new menswear fashion business which is being set up. So if you provide us with, say for example, $65, you'll get two bow ties and a tie um, after the investment, once the project is, we finish pitching for the project. It's really worth looking at crowdfunding. And then finally, factory. Factory is very common in the US. Unfortunately, it's almost never used for fashion startups in Europe. Factors lend based on the collateral invoices, also called accounts receivables. Factoring described, is described as borrowing money using your outstanding invoices to customers as collateral. I had the pleasure to meet in May 2012 in New York during a fashion law seminar at Fordham School of Law, Gary Wasner, who is the co-CEO of Hilden Factors. He is a typical example in New York City of a very hands-on Factor who goes to all the um, shows, I mean, most, a lot of shows at the New York Fashion Week, has actually a seat on the front row most of the time, and just looks at all the shows. He actually selects his uh, clients by looking at, at the shows, um, looking at their shows, and, of course, by doing quite a lot of work on their due diligence, account receivables, checking that everything is in good order from a financial standpoint. More on this later. We can move to the next slide now, Sylvia. Thanks. We are going to focus on bank loans and agreements with venture capitalist firms and business angels in this presentation, in this webinar, because this is where most critical legal problems may arise. Bankers and VCs, venture capitalists, and business angels are as a rule of thumb, quite sceptic towards fashion startups. I have been told by quite a few VCs that whenever they uh, see a uh, fashion designer who is talking to them about this great project to make, um, you know, for example, fashion clothes out of junk or a very innovative fashion uh, project, they don't really know how to assess such a project. They don't, they don't feel comfortable enough valuing the inequality of a fashion product. It's not their area of expertise. I would like to um, mention Tamara Mellon, who, um, of, of, of Jimmy Choo's fame. She's the co-founder of Jimmy Choo, and um, she mentions this anecdote about Robert Ben Susan, who at the time um, was the future chief executive of Jimmy Choo. In the uh, uh, noughties, Robert Medsoussan approached private equity fund Phoenix. Private equity, sorry, in, this is a parenthesis I have to make. Private equity is the next stage after you've got some venture capitalists. Private equity is usually provided to companies who need a higher ticket than 1 million euros of investment. So you don't go to your VCs in this instance, you go to a private equity firm to get the financing you need. Right, coming back to the anecdote. Robert Ben Susan goes to Phoenix, this private equity fund, and he talks to them about Jimmy Choo. The private equity guys say, Jimmy who? That was the reply. Robert got. So he said to them, well, just go home and ask your wives about Jimmy Choo. And the private equity people did and came back breathing with enthusiasm. 
says Mrs. Me Mrs. Mellon. And that shows you basically how comfortable financiers feel in relation to um, uh, fashion products. So in view of this situation, I think that the best angle for a fashion designer to obtain some um, backing from a banker or an equity investor is to come across as professional, business-minded, plan-oriented, and really prepared. Can we move on to the next slide, please? I think that the first step is to prepare a business plan. A preliminary remark about the business plan is that it will contain all your confidential information. It will contain all your future plans and present plans, all, so to speak, your secrets. So it's very important in your business plan to set out a confidentiality provision whereby the recipient of such business plan should not diffuse and send out the information set out in the business plan to any other unauthorized third parties. I also strongly suggest to even ask the third, the, your, your recipient of the business plan to sign a confidentiality agreement there are actually templates of confidentiality agreements in the ONIT website, I think. So why don't you leave with Sylvia Baumgart to get those templates of confidentiality agreements and make sure that you, um, you have this confidentiality agreement signed whenever you contact a potential investor to have a look at your business plan. A business plan is a formal statement of a set of business goals, the reasons they are believed attainable, and the plan for reach, reaching those goals. A business plan may contain background information about the organization or team attempting to reach those goals. Usually, a three to five year business plan is required, since investors will look for their annual return in that time frame. It's really strongly advisable to set out in that business plan projecting earnings and cash flow figures for the next three to five years. Bankers and investors like numbers. They want to see the Excel spreadsheets out there. And it's also really advisable to set out a clear list of your budget allocation that you plan to, um, sorry, the, basically the various types of costs that you want to have after the funding has been granted. How will you be spending all this money? It's quite good if you actually explain this into your business plan, the budget allocation. Also, it's good, very advisable to set out in your business plan a list and a detailed market study about your clients and prospects. Do you already have some orders placed and accounts refusable, receivables? Well, that's great. Say so in your business plan. Also, it's very important to insert a list and a market study about your suppliers, your business partners, your manufacturers, in short, your supply chain, without whom you would not be able to produce the creative products. It's very important to have your supply chain planning sorted and explaining your business plan. It gives you credibility. In addition, it's important to set out a list and a market study of your various points of sale and distribution channels in this business plan. Who are you going to approach to sell your fashion products? Indies, independent fashion stores, department stores, sports stores, general stores, discounters? Are you going to go to fashion chains? You're going to use the e-commerce as a distribution channel. All these things have to be carefully thought, uh, thought through before you send out your business plan, and they have to be explained into the plan, the business plan. Of course, a presentation of the intellectual property owned by the fashion business 
or if you have not yet incorporated your company by yourself, needs to be explained and set out in this business plan. On this note, I would strongly suggest that you register your trademark, i.e. the name of your fashion business, your logo, your brand, before you apply for financing. It is very important to have all your trademark in place because that could be really useful in case um, in case some other people are trying to um, um, take your name or logo for their own benefit. Think of the Louboutin versus Yves Saint Laurent case, for example. Last year, a uh, um, decision from the Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeal of New York was uh, published, which um, confirmed that the trademark Christian Louboutin, the famous shoe designer, had on uh, the red sole was actually valid. And thanks to this red sole trademark, Christian Louboutin obtained the confirmation from the Second Circuit Court of Appeal that he was the sole owner of this um, Red Soul trademark. And um, that, for example, Saint Laurent, Yves Saint Laurent, could not, send, uh, could not sell some shoes which were um, only for Red Soul. Red, red uh, the shoes from Saint Laurent, if they are monochromatic red, i.e. both the shoe is red and also the, the, the sole is red, can sell this type of shoes. But if Saint Laurent was to sell some shoes which only have a red sole, the rest of the shoe being of another color, then that may infringe Christian Louboutin trademark on the red sole. So registering your trademark is very important for a fashion designer, even at the very start of a business. If you have created an invention which is new and industrially applicable, then you need to apply for a patent. In the fashion business, patents are quite rare. However, there is one area which has seen quite a lot of patents being filed, and that is women's underwear. For example, Katerina Plou, an American lady, filed for its registration of a patent in the early noughties in relation to a, a bra, which basically is a convertible bra, uh, which allows you to put your straps of that bra in many different ways. Katerina, at the same time as she was obtaining that patent, was also speaking to several fashion houses one of them being Victoria's Secret of Victoria's Secret fame. After a while, Victoria's Secret started selling into the market a bra called 100 Waist Trappist Convertible Bra, while Victoria's Secret has actually terminated any negotiations or talks with Katerina Plou. So what did Katerina Plou did? She actually filed a lawsuit, and the court decided last year that the Victoria's Secret 100 Way Trappist Convertible Bra was very, very similar to the bra described in the patent that Katerina Plou owned. And I read in a fashion law blog that apparently... Ms. Plou and Victoria's Secret settled in June 2012. They issue, legal issue. So this, is, I think, is a good example of how having filed a patent on the invention, which is new and industrially applicable, is critical. If possible, it's also advisable to register the designs of your most important fashion products which you think will be best sellers way before you start selling them.
in this business plan, I think it's also very important that you clarify whether you may be able to, say, for example, provide some um, uh, security interest over certain assets. It can be a good, um, a good um, point. I mean, it could be a good, um, a good way for you to convince your banker, for example, to make you a loan to start your business. If you can put put some collateral over a um, an asset which is which you own and that is quite um, quite uh, um, uh, valuable then that could that could make the difference between you being able to obtain a, a bank's loan or not and i was um, i mean first port, port, port of call in terms of personal asset could be uh, 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 having a security interest over your house in, if it's a, a security interest over some assets from your business then it could be security interest over your account receivables or your intellectual property. Can we move on to the next slide, Sleep that Sylvia, please? And to the next slide. To the next slide as well is, is good. Thank you. Um, this point about security interest, we're going to, to discuss in, in more details now. This is also a very important point that needs to be negotiated with your financial stakeholders. As I just mentioned before, if you want to secure some bank finance, if you're going to obtain some bank financing, usually you, you, you will have more clout, so to speak, or you will have, your, 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 your banker will, will, uh, will feel more comfortable perhaps uh, le loaning, loaning you this money if you can uh, put some security. And my... important to seek legal advice in relation to the review of the security agreements. Because, yes, yeah, sure, you could put a, a, a security interest over your, your house, over very valuable assets such as jewelry, or etc. But you, you really want to make sure that um, uh, the terms of the security uh, agreement are fair and, and that you can comply with them. Because if there is a problem in your business and you um, have a difficulty to make your loan repayments, for example, you do not want to be left high and dry losing, for example, your house or something. So my advice would be really to seek legal advice for um, the review of the security agreements. In relation to both bank financings and equity financings, it's really important to make sure that your and you can comply with the positive and negative covenants as well as the undertakings that are set out in the various agreements that you, you are going to sign and that you can comply with that, sorry, the various representations which are made in these agreements are true. For example, you have to be careful of certain undertakings in your, say, for example, bank loan agreement whereby it is confirmed that you or your company are the sole and beneficial owner of the intellectual property which is material in the context of your business. Why do you have to be careful about these clauses? Because if in fact you actually co-own this background intellectual property with someone else, say for example you're a fellow student from Central St. Martin's with whom you've made the uh, fashion collection together and, um, and now it's actually decided not to pursue working with you. So say if this IP is co-owned by someone else who is not part of your new business venture, then not only could you be sued by this ex-fellow student who notices that you are using the co-owned IP, background IP, into your new business venture, but also this situation could trigger a default, an event of default under your loan agreement because the representation whereby you confirmed that you are the sole and beneficial owner of intellectual property with this material in the context of your business was wrong, was a misrepresentation. So it's very important 
to check that these undertakings, these representations can be complied with and are true. Another point to watch out for is the information undertaking to supply to the financial backers the audited financial statements for a financial year within 90 days at the end of each financial year. If you don't provide these financial statements in time for your fashion business, it may, for example, trigger an event of default under the loan agreement, which could have some wide repercussions over the duration of your loan and repayment schedule. Finally, it's important to check the term, that the terms are fair and in your best interest in those financing agreements, in particular in relation to a bank loan. It's very important to review thoroughly provisions relating to the interest rate, interest rate, commissions and fees. Are all these reasonable? Uh, the maturity of the loan as well is quite critical, as well as the repayment schedule and amounts. You don't want your repayment amounts on a monthly basis to be too high. You want to make sure that you can actually really repay them. And you also need to check in this bank loan agreement that the events which would trigger an event of default, as I just mentioned before. For an equity deal, it's really important to thoroughly review the provisions of the share purchase agreement. A share purchase agreement is an agreement whereby the equity investors are going to obtain some preferred stocks or preferred shares in exchange for their equity money. Well, for example, you don't you want to make sure that they're not going to a you know a, an outrageously high percentage of your sh shareholding while you basically end up being a very very tiny minority shareholder in your company and therefore you have no control anymore on your business because the minority shareholder um, has difficulty in obtaining the decisions that he wants if he's the only one voting for them at, uh, at uh, various uh, um, companies' meetings. You also want to make sure that the right of first refusal agreement, if there is one in your equity deal, is watertight and also in your best interest. A right of in a right of first refusal agreement is a um, an agreement whereby the founders of a, a, a company will agree to sell or to propose the sale of a shares first to the equity investors. So you want to make sure that there is, for example, a limited amount of time whereby you will have to ask first your, your equity investors to agree or disagree to buying back your shares if you want to get out of the business. It can't, you, you can't be waiting for a very, very long period where you, you know, if you really want to sell out those shares. So the mechanics of being able to go out of a business or, 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 or in, which is set out in this right of first refusal agreement really need to be thoroughly reviewed and, uh, and uh, negotiated. Of course, since the shareholding of your company is going to change when you've got some equity investors coming into your company, they're going to get all these preferred stock, preferred shares, remember, then you have to also thoroughly review and check your amended and restated articles of incorporation. For example, you want to check who's got some voting rights. Are the equity investors going to vote as well in decisions of, of which involve your company? Another question is, who is going to sit on the board of directors? Are some of the VCs going to be directors? Are they going to be on the board? There are lots of questions that you need to check, and I would really strongly suggest that you get legal advice in relation to your various equity deals. We can move on to the next slide, Sylvia. Am I doing okay for time, Sylvia? You have 20 minutes left. Now we're going to take a, a little step back um, and put on hold for, for two minutes the financial, financial 
considerations, money considerations that you have to um, think about uh, when you start up. We're going to think about how to negotiate with your business partners. In parallel, while you are doing all these negotiations with your financial stakeholders, it's important to talk to your business partners. Investment in the fashion business that does not only come in the form of financial investment, intellectual property investment, such as know-how, the intellectual property of business partners, also count towards making your fashion business a success. These business partners who contribute to the development of your fashion business should definitely be well looked after. And in particular, I would advise to enter into written agreements with them to define the scope of this fashion, sorry, this business relationship. And in particular, in, in, in order to define how they are going to be financially remunerated and who you saw is going to own the intellectual property that is going to come out from your business collaborations and, uh, and uh, partnership. You need to negotiate, negotiate these agreements too. We can move on to the next slide. Yeah, okay, fine. No, it's fine. We're on the, no sorry, we were on the right slide, sorry. So how to negotiate with your business partners? Well, there are lots of ways, some of them being uh, in collaborations or um, mutual help that you would provide one to each other. But I think that here, for the purpose of this webinar, we are going to focus on those two types of business partnerships which could trigger the most legal issues, and these are outsourcing and licensing. Outsourcing is the action of contracting out of an internal business process to a third-party organization. It is the practice of contracting a business process rather than staffing it internally. For a fashion, business, fashion startup, that is something that I think you will come across quite often. So you enter into a contractual agreement involving an exchange of services and payments. For example, you may hire a design company to design your corporate identity, brand identity manual, and logo. All these deliverables would be considered to be your company's IP, and you would pay the design company as a contractor in relation to that project. Well, from a legal standpoint, it's very important that you make sure that such contract that you sign with your design company provides that you will be the sole and exclusive owner of the IP intellectual property created by the contractor. So, for example, in the case of this design company, you need to make sure that there is a clause in the contract setting out that you will actually be the sole and exclusive owner of the logo that they have designed for you, of a brand identity manual, etc. You have to make sure that it is a sole uh, ownership that you have, not a temporary loan or, or, or license. Uh, it needs to be a permanent sale of your IP that you have to strike with your, your, your contractor through this outsourcing contract. Moving on to license agreements. Licensing is a partnership between an intellectual property rights owner called a licensor and another who is authorized to use such rights called a licensee in exchange for an agreed payment which can be made either by way of a fee or royalty. There are several categories of licensing agreements. Those which would apply in the fashion business would be, for example, trademark licensing and franchising agreements, copyright license agreements, or technology license agreements. In practice, all or some of these agreements 
often form part of one single contract, since in transfers of its nature, many rights are involved and not simply one type of intellectual property right. License agreements provide fashion startups, small and medium enterprises as a licensor or a licensee a wide variety of possibilities in conducting business in their own country or elsewhere. As an IP owner and licensor, your startup or small and medium enterprise can expand its business to the frontiers of your partner's business and ensure a steady stream of additional income for you. As a licensee, your company can manufacture, sell, import, export, distribute and market various goods or services which it may be prevented from doing otherwise. Examples of fashion licensing agreements are plenty. Two areas who um, are very, very, are almost always done through licensing agreements are eyewear and perfume. For example, Paul Smith, Gucci, Karen Miller, etc., all license a trademark for use on branded eyewear and the eyewear cases. Another example is Dolce & Gabbana, who is under license to Procter & Gamble in relation to perfumes. Another example is the designer, a designer sorry, such as Orla Keely or a company such as Liberty who may license the copyright of a print to a homeware retailer for use on the furniture upholstery occasions. In the international context, a formal licensing agreement is only possible if intellectual property rights you want to license is also protected in the other country or countries of interest to you. If your intellectual property is not protected in such of a country or countries, then you would not only not be able to so sorry, you would only not be able to license it, but you, you would have no legal right to put any restriction on its use by anyone else. Conclusion is very important, as I mentioned before, to register your intellectual property and then once you've obtained the registration of your trademark, your copyright, etc. In, in, in a particular country, then to expand it internationally, to expand your intellectual property rights internationally. On copyright, in um, in, the, in Europe, you do not usually need to register a copyright. That's something which just comes with your product. But for example, in the US, you do need to register a copyright. So this is also something to, take, to bear in mind when you want to have a, an international strategy, and in particular, when you want to have a formal licensing agreement in relation to your fashion products. In order to assess, to gouge more, um, uh, more thoroughly over legal considerations whenever you, are, you think of um, signing a license agreement, I would strongly recommend that you read the excellent PDF document entitled Intellectual Property in the Fashion Design Industry, published by the Center for Fashion Enterprise. I can send you further information about that at the end of the presentation if you email me, okay? We can move on to the next slide, Sylvia. Thank you. Just to say, it's also on our website, or people can go to the Center of Fashion Enterprise website and they'll find it there. Okay, thank you. Right, now we're coming back to the financing issues we were we were talking about before we had this aparté, this little... Uh, this little um, uh, chat about licensing and outsourcing. So, what's next about after? Sorry, what's next after obtaining funding for your fashion business? What are your duties? Well, sorry, your duties all start when you finally obtain the coveted financing. 
you have to be ready to face these responsibilities, financial and others. How do you do that? Go to the next slide. Thank you. Well, you have to step on top of your finances and your loan repayment schedule. This is a rule of thumb. Um, if you have secured, uh, if you have obtained, sorry, a bank loan, you really have to make sure that you pay your loan repayments in time. You also have to look after your equity backers by giving them updates on your business on a regular basis. Obviously, if they sit on the board of directors, you will see them quite a lot. Well, you have to make sure you get on well with them because that actually um, will be very critical to the success of your business, especially if they're on the board of, uh, of, of directors or, or, or else. Um, you can also send them some press cuttings if your fashion business is mentioned. Um, you can ask them also to mentor you. A lot of business angels are seasoned business people themselves. Usually, they, you know, if they are wealthy, it's because they've done fairly well in the business world most of the time. Well, why don't you ask them to become your mentors as well? I don't know. Send them big Christmas cards. You have to be creative, but you really have to look after your equity backers. Same thing applies if you have obtained a bank loan. You need to be in touch with your banker. It especially, I mean, especially you, you in particular, sorry, you really have to let them know sooner rather than later if you encounter difficulty in meeting the loan repayments. It's a financial is well looked after, will prove more sympathetic in case you need some extra financing, a reschedule of your loan payment, or anything else. You also have, obviously, uh, to develop a thriving creative business, a thriving fashion business. In particular, uh, from a financial uh, standpoint, that means that you have to account to collect your account receivables within a reasonable time frame. I know that in the fashion world, sometimes certain stores, um, distribution channels, tend to take quite a lot of time to pay their, uh, their invoices. And so you end up be having some account receivables for a very long, long uh, amount of time. Uh, I think this is particularly true with uh, department stores. Well, okay, this is a context, but really best practice would be to get paid within a month, your account receivables. So this is really what you have to work towards and to put in place a good process so that cash comes into your business because cash is the key, especially in a fashion business. You've got to have some cash coming in. Also, I would strongly suggest that you follow, especially as a fashion startup, that you follow the principles of lean manufacturing. Lean, L-E-A-N, manufacturing, is a production practice that considers the expenditure of resources for any goal other than the creation of value for the end customer to be wasteful and versus a target of elimination. Remember Gary Wasner from Hilden Factor I mentioned before? Well, when I met him with the other people attending the Fashion Law Seminar in New York in May last year, he said to us the following thing. He said, bankers don't really understand fashion businesses. We asked him, why? Well, when they go to see the fashion designer studio and they see all you know, these dresses and racks and all these shoes and all these fashion products in store there, stock up, they say, oh, that's good. This is a, this is a, a, a tangible business, you know. It has some stock. It's got some inventory. That's great. We feel we feel ready to to actually uh, lend some money to this uh, this fashion business. Gary thinks exactly the opposite. Gary is a fan of lean manufacturing, of lean manufacturing. For him, a fashion designer who has lots and lots and lots of inventory in his studio is not doing well because this inventory should not be stuck up in the studio. It should be actually in the various shops where the fashion design, designer is, uh, is supposed to actually sell all his fashion products. Gary was explaining to us that fashion goes out of fashion very quickly. There are, as you know, some uh, catwalks every 
six months or even more regularly than that. Some capsule collections created over time. And therefore, fashion is a fast business. Therefore, Gary is an adept of lean manufacturing in the sense that he doesn't like to see a lot of inventory in stock um, in his designer studio. He thinks that all this should be sent out to the various distribution channels. So you really have to think through about these things. I mean, what happens, for example, at the end of the, um, of the season, if you're still left with some, uh, some um, uh, fashion products which have not been sold? Well, you have to think about what you're going to do. Are you going to sell them some, to some discounts, to send them to some discounts to sell? Are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to use some, um, uh, fashion, some discounts website so that, so that it's, it, it's, uh, it's a better way of, of uh, finding a way to... to um, uh, to, to sell these, uh, these fashion products, you really have to think through about those distribution channels, as I've thought before. And it's really important as well to be an adept of lean manufacturing, as I've just explained. And then, uh, once you've got a thriving business and uh, that uh, you're doing well in terms of uh, keeping uh, in touch with your financial, stake financial stakeholders, and keeping up with uh, the loan repayment, if you've obtained a, a, a loan, then you need to think about the next steps. Plan ahead. If your business is doing very well and you want to expand in various cities and or abroad, you will probably have to talk to the finance guys again. Or you probably need to strike some new business partnership to um, secure a license agreement or any other type of uh, business partnership that you can think about that will accelerate the growth of your business. I think it is good practice as well to update your business plan on a regular basis and to consult with your lawyer and accountant to figure out which mean of financing would be the best to grow your business to the next stage. I think we can move on to the next uh, slide, Sylvia. Thank you. Okay, that's it for me um, uh, in relation to my presentation. And I really wish you all the best for your fashion business venture. And I'm now ready to take questions um, from you. You can use the chat box to um, send us some questions. I'm checking my Twitter account as well to see if there's been any live tweets. Don't hesitate to live tweet on at Crefavi if you wish to uh, get the answers to your questions. And well, when we don't have um, any questions, just um, can you maybe quickly explain what you mean with equity because um, obviously, you know, I know what it is, but, um, you know, some people might not be so familiar with the, with the term. So what, what is equity finance? Well, as, as I think I've, I've tried to uh, <laughs> explain equity, so I'm happy to, yes, of course, to expand on this. Equity finance is obtaining some funding money from third parties who will in return obtain some shares, some preferred stock, some, some preferred shares from your company. So that is what is equity finance. Equity finance, as I also I think uh, uh, briefly touched on before, is dividing on is divided in different types. When you are a startup, you usually speak to the business angels because business angels usually invest up to, I'd say, probably a million. So that each business angel would invest several thousands of uh, uh, of of, um, um, of pounds or euros into your business. If you need bigger rounds of uh, financing, of equity financing, that usually for a ticket of 1 million to 2 million, you usually speak to the, the VCs, the venture capital funds I spoke before. 
And then when your fashion business is really a mature business, it's doing very well, but um, it still needs some equity financing, you would speak to the private equity funds because here there would the ticket for of entry for a, of a, for a private equity fund would be higher than a few million pounds or euros. But I think, guys, for you it's going to be at the next stage. For the moment, we were focusing this webinar on fashion startups. So equity finance for fashion startups would be, I think, is, uh, targeted towards mainly business angels and. Um, for some of you, perhaps, venture capital funds. And as I mentioned, there is this um, new business angels network. It's called Fashion Business Angels, Réseau uh, Business Angels Mod, which has been launched last year in December by the Fédération Française du Prêt-à-Porter Féminin and uh, the International Chamber of Commerce of Paris. So why don't you talk to them? So um, any European designer can um, apply. Well, nowadays, maybe I think the economy is, is global, and especially if you, for example, sell your product over the internet, uh, your possible clients, I mean, your, 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 your prospects and your clients will probably be based all over the world. So I think that a business angel has vocation to invest in ta internationally, but this is something that um, can be checked with the network in particular. The lady who manages this network and um, who is, the, I'd say, the coordinator between the um, between the business angels and the fashion, uh, the fashion entrepreneurs is called Patri um, uh, Miss Joku. I think her name is Patricia Joku, J O K H O O, and she works for the Fédération Française du Prêt à Porter Féminin. So it might be a good idea to speak to her and check. Okay, I think um, uh, we don't have um, any further relevant questions. So, um, shall we just um, end this? And you know, if if people have questions, then they can either you know email you or email us, and um, and we will try to follow up. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, actually, there's going to be my details if uh, you would like to follow up with me after this uh, webinar. I am available on annabelle.goberti at crefavi.com. And um, I would like to thank again Sylvia and George for organizing this webinar in such a swift and, um, and um, efficient manner and uh, for being so nice with me in, uh, in explaining to me how to, how to, to do a, a, we a webinar because this is the first one in my life. Great. Thank you all, and good luck with your fashion um, enterprises. Uh, so all the best. Thanks, Annabelle. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.